Greetings from the International Labour Organization and its cooperatives unit where uh, we are commemorating uh, its centenary and on this occasion we have uh, been holding a series of interviews with cooperative leaders, practitioners from around the world. Today we have the pleasure of having Ian MacDonald uh, join us. He's the former Director General of the International Cooperative Alliance. Welcome Ian, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for asking me and um, of course, congratulations to the, uh, the cooperative unit for its uh, uh, centenary celebrations. I mean, uh, a fantastic achievement and a unique organization which I was always happy to work with. And you indeed were there at very historic occasion of the uh, adoption of the ILO recommendation 193 on the promotion of cooperatives, but we shall get to that. If you can uh, start by telling us how you got the cooperative bug. Well, uh, it's interesting. I don't come from a background of cooperation or cooperators. And as many of your other interviewees have said in the UK, our, uh, the cooperative movement tends to be dominated by the consumer sector, the consumer retail movement. So everybody you know is aware of a, of a cooperative uh, shop mm -hmm. in their high street or, or, and, and things like that. But I, I wasn't any more familiar with it than that, really. Um, and I have to say it was um, my political involvement with the, the Labour Party in the UK. And in the UK, we have a strange set up for other countries, that is, whereas we have a, a cooperative party as well as a, a Labour Party. And when, when I got involved in the Labour Party, I became aware of its existence and decided to uh, look into it more and, and join it. And I, I just found that um, the, the values and principles of the, of the cooperative movement as expressed there were tuned very nicely with the way I had been thinking for many years in, in terms of um, solidarity and equality and all the other values. And uh, so it was really, uh, I have to say, political motives that got me involved in the uh, cooperative movement. And then I used to receive a, a left-wing publication called Tribune in, uh, in the UK. And uh, in that was advertised the position of a education officer for, for the Scottish part of the cooperative movement. And I was living in London at the time. So I was attracted with going back to Scotland, but also working with the cooperative sector. And um, I had been in uh, the civil service, which uh, was um, a somewhat dull occupation at the time I felt, and uh, looking to do something a bit more active than and work according to your own beliefs, which was very uh, lucky thing to be able to do. And I, I got this job, which was part of the Cooperative College. I know Sterling Smith and others have talked to you about the co Cooperative College in the UK. Physically, it was based in uh, England and uh, near Loughborough, but uh, they had an outreach worker for Scotland, which is the job I got. So that, that's, that's what got me going. The Labour Party and the Cooperative Party in the UK were historically strongly connected, no, before they split up. But even then, they still do vote uh, together on a number of uh, critical social sure. issues to this day. Yeah, sometimes I think they're too close um, mm -hmm. because um, obviously the Labour Party is much bigger than the Cooperative Party. and it, it tends to dominate um, the agenda and especially more recently the uh, cooperative party has developed policies which are, i think are are more radical and more interesting and more in tune with what is required in today's society so i feel that the um, not that they shouldn't have uh, an electoral agreement which is the official terminology at the moment uh, you can be a cooperative and labour member of parliament um, or a cooperative and labour local councillor like I was and they, uh, that works quite well but um, they were never one group, they were separately formed in 
18, I think, the party was set up and they came to an electoral agreement with the Labour Party because they did have a lot in common, but they've never been one organisation, so they've always mm -hmm. been two separate ones. And at the moment, I think it's important that that separation is um, maintained and even intensified. You were a candidate for Parliament at some point, weren't you? Uh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm never quite from sure. Argyll. Yeah. I'm never quite sure if I made the right decision there. I was uh, adopted as the parliamentary candidate for Argyll and Butte, which um, was quite a difficult constituency because, um, you know, traditionally it had always been a liberal or conservative seat. Uh, but um, I was. Um, living in that area and a, a councillor for the local council so I was adopted as the candidate um, which I was for about a year and it was also the, the election was the one where Tony Blair swept to power so I've got a feeling I made a big mistake maybe because I was then offered a, a post in Manchester with the cooperative movement in Manchester as the headquarters of the movement in the UK mm. so I, I I was, uh, I had a hard decision to make and I, the decision I did make was to go to Manchester and I was never sure for about the next five years whether that was the right decision. But on the other hand, had I not taken that job, I probably wouldn't have ended up with the job in Geneva. So, and I had no regrets about that. That's true. You were the Director General of the International Cooperative Alliance from 2002 to 2011. Yeah. important decade and uh, ICA was headquartered in uh, Geneva then. Geneva. Could you tell us uh, a little bit about that period? What were your priorities? Uh... Yeah, I mean, uh, I was, first of all, absolutely delighted to get the position. Um, although at that time, um, it became very apparent very quickly that uh, ICA was in a, not a very healthy position from a from a financial point of view uh, <clears throat> as you may know all member based organizations always struggle you find that mm -hmm. the representative bodies of cooperatives throughout the world aren't the what bodies making the money you know like credit agricole or refaison mm -hmm. or somebody like that we have to rely on those people to fund us and similarly in in your countries federal bodies you find that cooperatives representative bodies do an important job but they always struggle for funds and so it's quite a difficult uh, balance to strike between pushing for more funds and not losing members as a result of it <clears throat> and in the ICA at that time there had been some big arguments about whether um, you know whether the level of membership was right what kind of membership we were trying to achieve the uh, whether the people, the members from poorer countries should pay the same amount as members from wealthier countries, all these things. And it was quite difficult. And in fact, I think just before I had arrived, there had been a very difficult board meeting where um, jobs were lost and um, decisions were made, which were very difficult for those there at the time in terms of future funding and trying to maintain the, the level of uh, involvement which the ICA had at the time. Uh, but um, who uh, Ivana Barberini was the president mm -hmm. at the time, who you may remember, <clears throat> was a very fine man in my view. Not easy to work with, I hasten to add, but uh, at the same time, I got to admire him greatly, a great thinker um, and a complete workaholic, which um, didn't always help. But uh, he, um, he, he had a tendency to invite me to Italy, which was a nice place to go to, for, uh, to discuss pre-agenda meetings for the next board meeting. And he would take me to Italy and we would go to, he would take me to a local restaurant He'd always buy a very fine red wine for me to drink because he didn't drink. So by the time we got to the actual meeting, he was well ahead in his mental capacity and able to dominate the meeting. And therefore, <laughs> therefore he always got his own way. But he was, uh, he was a good man. But he was very, very almost Scottish in his um, approach to the um, 
financial situation and he he was brutal in effect in trying to mm. resolve that issue and mm. I have to say in hindsight he was right um, mm. but it was in my nature to um, not to overspend and to minimize expenditure and slowly but surely and with the help of a very good finance director Guy Malacrida who's still working in Geneva um, he uh, we res we got to a position at least when the uh, finances were stable um, it was never going to be much more than that but and I think even now we're it's stable but it was a result of many years of, of much work now, having said that you asked about priorities I mean that was a priority clearly but it was a priority mm -hmm. that only affected us internally if you like it didn't have the mm. Well, you need a healthy organization to make progress. However, my priority was always to try and raise the profile of the ICA itself, but also of cooperatives in general, because for us in the cooperative world, it's very easy to get totally absorbed in it and forget that there are other forms of business, there are other structures out there who don't know anything about cooperative. And unfortunately, there's more of them in a sense, because the world out there doesn't often enough consider the cooperative option and how cooperatives can resolve and they can resolve many of the world's problems today um, and even today the situation is still that people don't know about this it's not so much they don't like it or they're against it they just don't know that option is out there and i think the work that we do and the work that you do is so important to try and get this profile up especially in this very peculiar time not necessarily right now with the virus etc but also but this time of um, huge riches on one hand and dreadful poverty on the other hand and the gap between the rich and the poor widening mm -hmm. and of course the cooperative model of business is designed to to avoid that so mm -hmm. priority was always the profile and if we got the profile up therefore people would hopefully pay more attention to the the serious alternative that we offered who were you trying to raise uh, the profile of cooperatives uh, with was it international organizations other business bodies governments uh, ngos who were your targets at the time i think probably more than anything it would be um, governments and international organizations of influence which is why 193 was so important because at last we had a tool by which we could um, encourage um, governments to take action uh, because they all signed recommendation 193 and were there, uh, but they needed in many cases a, a gentle uh, or maybe not so gentle push to actually do something about it. Um, and then if it's on a government agenda, they can then encourage the business sector and other sectors to to make progress now i'm not sure if my facts and figures are up to date but i'm not sure we have yet really cracked that um issue of making cooperatives as um obvious a choice of business structure than your normal what, what we would call normal um, investor owned mm -hmm. capitalistic business structure it's available certainly in the in the western world and in in some developing countries obviously cooperatives have a bigger impact but then i get disappointed that when that impact is made sometimes the governments there get more interested in the investor owned model and i i most definitely believe that the cooperative model is is a superior model as I still keep the strap line from the 2012 um, year of cooperatives on my on my signature on my emails because I do think it it reflects that. But an awful lot of work needs done, and and it's difficult. Yeah, the motto was uh, cooperatives uh, build a better world. That's right. So yeah. now we are talking about uh, cooperatives can build back a better world. Ah, indeed. Uh, from, yeah, the, no, no. from the well, pandemic, no? But well, cooperatives 
in periods of crisis, it's, it's been proved. I remember a, a leaf, um, a booklet produced by um, Johnson Birchall and Lou Hamill Kettleson mm -hmm. for the ILO and us. I think it was a joint project uh, uh, after the, 20, uh, the 2008 financial crash. Uh, they did a very brief but very um, articulate document which showed quite clearly that, that cooperatives were far more financial, financially stable and successful in the period of crisis, mm -hmm. largely because of their risk adverse nature. Uh, and for me, it also reflected that the values and principles of cooperatives were what is missing in the normal um, business world and therefore showed how much better people could um, live, better quality of life, etc. if cooperatives were the normal business practice. And unfortunately, we're not at that point yet. Mm. Johnson Birchall, in fact, did a, a follow-up to that, looking at financial cooperatives in yeah. the uh, post-financial crisis and showing how people were flocking to these uh, uh, financial cooperatives, having lost faith in the uh, investor-owned uh, banks uh, and, and yeah. uh, so on. And yeah. this anti-cyclical nature is again uh, important as as the world of wor work is changing now with the environment, with pandemic, and all these uh, pressing uh, crises. Wouldn't you say this democratic ownership, uh, member-based uh, driven, community-based driven nature of co-ops is uh, valuable now? Uh, as ever, if not more. Well, more, more so. I mean, in fact, you mentioned the key word there, in my view, is ownership. Mm. Um, if you look around the, the um, business world today and, and, and outside the business world, the, the question of ownership is always there. Now, whether it actually is seen like that or not, I'm not sure, but I'm absolutely convinced that the... Uh, more democratic structure of a business and that doesn't have to be terribly dramatic elections every five minutes and rule by committees all these things that people get very worried about it's just that the people who are involved in the business whether the the, the consumers the workers uh, the um, owners they all have a say in the, running the business and that's my definition of democracy and if I was, I always say, if I was to pick one of the values of cooperation, which is more important than any others, and really the answer is they're all equally important. But democracy is the key. Without democracy, you can't have um, a, a real cooperative and you can't have uh, the advantages which cooperation brings to, to the business sector. And very simple examples of that are where, uh, I believe still uh, in Germany after the war, the Allies insisted on a semi-democratic um, ownership model for, for German businesses, some of which still survives today. And, um, and yet in the countries who insisted upon it, like the States and the UK, there is much less of emphasis on that. And result today is, is that Germany is a far more successful country than, hmm. than UK or or, um, or USA, I would, I would say, on certain uh, measurements. And the, the proof is there in the eating that this is what, um, this is how business could be run much more successfully than it is at the moment. And this notion of employee ownership uh, is uh, yeah. even more relevant now with uh, bankruptcies looming for uh, many uh, mom and pop shops, uh, many traditional businesses, and a transition to worker ownership, including through the cooperative model, should be there on the table. What is it you think that's holding back cooperatives being adopted as a model? What is the challenge? What is uh, the reason for that? Well, um... I was I was told when I arrived at the ILO that I had to be uh, a little more um, even-handed in my political outlook on the world um, 
because of course our board represented all shades of opinion, but we agreed on one thing, which was cooperatives. But I think I think the um, um, the the reason that uh, cooperatives one of the reasons that cooperatives are struggle is that there is an inherent opposition to that idea. Um, I think most people would accept that in the Western capitalist world, um, big business, uh, neoliberal business, you know, the Facebooks of this world, the Googles and the Microsofts are incredibly powerful organizations, incredibly powerful. Um, and of course, not remotely democratic, um, nor do they pretend to be. Um, but in my opinion, causing quite some quite serious problems in the world. Um, but they, my interpretation is they and the likes do not want cooperatives to succeed. They're quite happy for a few to um, be out there and be, be pointed at and be used as examples, but in no way do they want a world economy dominated by cooperatives. And um, so that's a slightly more sinister look at it, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, the nature of cooperators and cooperatives is to be nice, is to be even handed, is to be pleasant and see the world in rose tinted glasses and all the rest of it and try and improve things for everybody, equality, solidarity, helping others, all this stuff. And sometimes I think we do that a little too much and we should be a little firmer. And um, no, I don't want to be like the other sectors, but we should be shouting our own case a bit more loudly and showing people that we are up to taking difficult, hard decisions just like anybody else. But um, I do think there is a hostility to cooperatives out there uh, you know, um, perhaps not in a obvious sense, but uh, there's a subcurrent of hostility to cooperatives and how they um, operate within this world, this capitalist world. And unfortunately, that's what we do have to do, because in most cases, in many countries, that's where we're living. So I think there's um, that's one of the main reasons for it. And of course, governments are, who make these decisions at the end of the day are affected by uh, the powerful people within their own societies and communities and therefore they're not going to stand up and say we want cooperatives uh, investor-owned businesses can go away I'm afraid we're not at that point yet so it, mm. we have to strike a balance though and of course I'm not saying that cooperatives can be the only form of business structure in the world they can't be but they mm. should be much more seriously mm. um, accepted structure than they are at the moment part of the diversity of uh, diversity. business models that we That's can right. imagine uh, for right. yeah, yeah. a better world, more sustainable uh, yeah. world. You mentioned the cooperative principles and uh, specifically highlighted uh, part uh, uh, members' uh, democratic participation. And I was wondering if you would care to elaborate a little bit around uh, co-op principle six, uh, which is cooperation among uh, cooperatives. cooperatives. And you mentioned how there is diversity in the co-op world, uh, sectoral size, uh, according to country. Um, and uh, I'm sure uh, during your time as ICA uh, DG, but uh, today too, there is that um, dichotomy of well-established traditional uh, cooperatives and then these emerging new uh, cooperatives among uh, youth, uh, informal workers, uh, uh, platform now economy workers. Uh, what, what does uh, activating that principle mean for these new emerging type of cooperatives? So. Well, yeah, I mean, we, for a while when I was in that job, uh, uh, I think we called them new wave cooperatives. There's different mm -hmm. expressions for new cooperatives. And the, for some of us from a more fundamentalist background and we'll try not to be too fundamentalist, but they did 
offer a challenge because sometimes they didn't quite fit into our mm -hmm. accepted understanding on, of what a cooperative is. My line these days is very much that we accept any st structure that moves towards what we see as our values and principles. But I think if you, if you take an attitude that our values and principles are totally sacrosanct and you can't move one inch from the written word of what they say, that's when, that's, that is fundamentalism. We see it in religions and elsewhere that this is a hard thing to maintain. And the ICA was the, is the guardian of the, of the, the statement of identity of the, of the values and principles of cooperation. But it is not, um, uh, it's not a police force. So we can't really say there's a, um, a police, uh, that, that these organizations must observe to the letter every, every principle. And as far as cooperating among cooperatives is, that in fact was one of the hardest um, principles to adopt because they had, um, I don't know, uh, like any big organizations, we had our differences amongst us. And then, you know, you ask um, a, a consumer co-op to deal with the um, banking sector or to deal with the credit unions, to deal with the agricultural co-ops. And they're all very different. They come from different angles. So it's quite difficult to put that into practice. Um, so I. I think, uh, sorry, there's a, a noise going on outside a minute, so I'm slightly different. No, it's okay. Sorry, sorry, somebody was at the door um, disturbing me. Sorry, did I complete that uh, answer? I'm not sure I did. Thank you. No, uh, with social cooperatives, these arguments, of course, and laws catching up to these new forms of cooperatives uh, and uh, how yeah big well-established cooperatives can support both financially but through legal advice mentoring these you know new generation new wave as you mentioned cooperatives yes. so my I think question was uh, along uh, those lines then I think you you shared uh, your uh, observations I had Again, two sub questions from uh, your uh, uh, responses earlier. Uh, one is you were in Geneva then as ICA, but then uh, after you left, I think the ICA had moved to uh, Brussels. What was the reason for ICA to be in Geneva at the time? Could you tell us that? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I. Uh, on a human level, I find Geneva a very attractive place. And uh, uh, um, I often tell people when I moved to the job in Geneva, I exchanged a view of um, Strangeways Prison in Manchester um, with all the doom and gloom involved for a view of Mont Blanc from my office in uh, the Route des Morions in, in, in Geneva. So I was uh, more than happy from that angle. But the... Um, ICA was in Geneva, as I understand it, because it had previously been, uh, when was it, maybe at least 10 years before my time, if not longer, it was based in London. I think its original offices were in London. Uh, but then I think um, they appointed um, a Swiss person, I'm afraid I can't remember the names, um, but a Swiss person from, I think he was from... Uh, uh, Co-op Suisse um, to be the director general um, and he was very keen to be based in Switzerland and mm -hmm. Co-op Suisse offered uh, offices to the ICA I believe in that time and there was a decision made obviously to move to Switzerland and uh, offices were established I think in the Paquis area uh, with Co-op Suisse and then eventually they moved back up to the Route de Morion, um, and um, we I think we must have been there for 20, 30 years. Um, and then uh, in my time, I felt very strongly that it was the appropriate place to be because um, in a sense, either Geneva or New York were the two places that could be described as world centers. 
um, with uh, wearing the UN hat. Uh, and I think it was always important that the ICA and other international bodies were close to those centers. Uh, and Geneva also was a city of peace, a city of uh, social justice, Geneva Convention and all this. And I think it's very appropriate that cooperatives with their background in the peace mm. movement, which is something I might have mentioned was strongly influenced me as well, um, was the place to be. Uh, but then we had our own internal uh, discussions and um, there was a strong lobby from our European colleagues who felt very much at that time, the this is all flooding back suddenly. <laughs> at that time, the um, uh, the European office of the ICA wasn't separate. It was part of our headquarters in Geneva. So in effect, we had an officer based in Geneva who was also the the um, the head of uh, the European uh, of Co-ops Europe. Wasn't mm -hmm. the name we used at the time, but that became the name. So they were based in Geneva, and I think they felt they were being um, sidelined compared with the headquarters work. And when you had a, you had a regional headquarters in Costa Rica for the Americas, in uh, in two regional offices in Africa, uh, in uh, Burkina Faso, and in Kenya, and then of course in New Delhi as well. I think for Asia, people felt that Europe was being hard done by, which wasn't. I don't think was fair but however I, I understood the argument so there was a, a push at that time to have a separate European office in Brussels and I actually supported that but of course the people who were pushing for that were very much for Brussels being the epicenter of everything and um, eventually their arguments prevailed um, and I think also I would accept that there were an economic argument saying that because Co-ops Europe had an office already in, Bru in Brussels, we could just fit into that and therefore the ICA would be based in Brussels. But interestingly, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, that Bruno Rolands, who is now my successor plus one um, as DG of the ICA, and I dare say you know Bruno, um, he, he's based in Brussels, he always was based in Brussels with his job with Sicopa. And he's still in Brussels as DG of the ICA. He told me at a recent time I saw him in, in England that uh, he felt it was a mistake and that the ICA should have remained in Geneva because of that separate um, global sense which Geneva has. Brussels is great, but it's a European center. Geneva, in my view, has a, a unique position as a global center. I know it's part mm. of Switzerland, but it very much maintains this cosmopolitan global mm. Mm. global image. And I think with the your set, the ILO, the WHO and the other UN agencies based in Geneva, it was very appropriate. And I'm I'm sorry we left it. Um, but uh, I don't think it's done damage as such. But I, I, knew, I do know that colleagues in other parts of the world were a wee bit concerned about the center of cooperation moving from what they saw as a global set. They didn't really think of Geneva as part of Europe, even although it is as a global place to come to, as Brussels, which was very much just European. And they felt, I think, that the mm -hmm. pendulum swung too far in favor of the Europeans. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. probably balanced out now because these things die down. But um, mm -hmm. I think it's a shame in a way, and uh, I think uh, Brussels has, uh, or Geneva has a, a better image for, from a, a global perspective. Even now from a distance, I can see that um, very often when there are problems to resolve in the world, um, which is almost always, uh, uh, people will come to Geneva for arbitration in a whole variety of areas, not always necessarily connected with the UN, it's just the place you go to. And I think we were very well positioned there to maximize our, our influence. Um, and um, I think it's unfortunate that we moved. I don't think I would advocate moving back because then that's more disruption. But, you know, mm. these things mm. happen. 
Yeah, I mean, Geneva is an international organization center, UNHCR, WHO, ILO, uh, you mentioned. Um, What do you think is the role that these UN agencies, uh, FAO, that's uh, Rome-based, and uh, uh, UN DESA, New York, what do you, and ILO, what do you think uh, these organizations have as a role to play with respect to cooperatives, uh, and sustainable development. Uh, sure, I, I mean it's huge in my opinion. I'm I'm a total advocate of of the concept of the United Nations, the ILO, the WHO, and and all the agencies. And I think it's so important to the world today, and we're so globally organised and connected. Um, the problem is that your organisations, like ourselves are only as strong as your members allow you to be. And in your case, that's member countries. In our case, it's um, cooperative structures. And, you know, you just need to look at the position in the United States at the moment, which is obviously a major, if not the major funder of the UN and the ILO. And um, at the moment, they're inclined to back off and not to promote the UN and, and I think that all that does is cause more problems in the world and more division and the UN uh, and its agencies are the natural um, arbitrators of issues in the world and the more involved it is the better and the better the world is and we've seen where I don't know when the golden age was if there ever was one but it's not now I don't think but uh, when the ILO is more uh, when ILO and the UN is more accepted by all bodies, by all countries, it, it works wonderfully. Um, so it's not a question of blaming the ILO or the UN for not being effective enough, it's blaming their members for not making it effective enough. Yeah. And, and I think, um, I mean, WHO is an interesting example right now, when you've got um, the virus raging and they're doing their best without them, I think it would have been 10 times worse. And then you've got ridiculous decisions in the United States withdrawing from the WHO at the very time they need them most. Doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But the but the UN um, and the ILO need to, like the ICA, raise profile, promote all the time. It's you are one of these member organizations, like I was saying at the beginning, who have to survive on the goodwill of their members, but, but the profile must, has to come up. And I sometimes think you also should be a little more um, aggressive in your approach to world politics and to the situation that, that uh, you're in, that you do so much more, I think. Uh, I mean, I, I can confess, when I first joined the ICA, I didn't know what the ILO was. Mm. I knew what the UN was. I learned very quickly, I hasten to add, uh, but, and was very impressed, uh, but um, as an average Joe in, uh, in Scotland or in the UK, the ILO's profile is very, very low. As mm. is, and the UN people, are aware of the UN, but they're not aware of how it works and um, mm. what it's trying to do. So mm. I, I think there's an awful lot of work to be done there, but I'm mm. totally convinced of their, of its um, place in the world and how important it is more than ever, more than ever. When you joined the ICA as a DG, it was 2002, and that's the year recommendation 193, which you have referred to on a number of occasions, was adopted yeah. uh, at the ILO by uh, uh, not only member states, but also employers and workers' organizations uh, yeah. due to its tripartite structure. Uh, could you tell us a little bit what that uh, recommendation means and uh, for the cooperative movement? Yeah, but uh, I'd love to take some credit for that, but it, it was it was just happening as I arrived, so uh, um, I wasn't involved in it in the actual getting. I think I was at some meeting where it was just being approved and being prepared for action, and I was so impressed by the the whole idea of 
employers, workers, government. I mean, almost that's the complete set. Getting together and agreeing on such a subject is absolutely fantastic in the world. And uh, I don't think a day went past in the, in the ICA when we didn't refer to it in some way or another and use it. Um, and I remember many meetings with of different governments, not least our own one in the UK. And in that time, it was a Labour government, so we're a wee bit more inclined to persuade them to actually use it, to implement it. And I think that's that's the problem, isn't it? That the recommendation that was passed, um, I'm not sure if I'm right in saying this, but I think it was pretty, it, was it unanimous? I don't think anybody didn't sign it. I think there may have been one uh, abstaining, but right. otherwise, I think, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it was Although, one of the. Of course, it's not signed and uh, ratified as a convention, but. Uh, well, that's hmm. right. That's what I was going to come on to. Is I don't. What I'd like to see now is that uh, it did become a convention. I'm not sure if there is a process available that allows it to move from being a recommendation to convention, but that would give it some serious clout, wouldn't it? Um, not that it doesn't have it, it is used, and there are great examples over the world where countries have used 193 as absolutely blueprint for what they want to do. Um, and uh, uh, for me, that was so important. And uh, as I said, we always used 193, always referred to it. Mm. And it was a great tool for us when, we, I think I explained when we prepared, ICA was a bit messy, as I think I indicated when I got there, and not just financially, but structurally and strategically, and we eventually developed a five-year strategic plan and then moved forward. And of course, I, the 193 featured prominently within that plan, and uh, I imagine it still does, although I haven't read the recent one, um, thoroughly but uh, the the current um, DG who I referred to Bruno Rowlands of course was was very heavily involved in the discussions surrounding uh, as he represented the worker cooperative movement at the time mm -hmm. and of course traditionally worker you probably know in your history worker cooperatives and the trade union movement had their moments of disagreement to say the least goes right back to discussions in the, la in the 19th century with the Fabians in the UK not thinking that, um, that uh, workers were up to running their own businesses, you know, terrible stuff, but that's what they said. And uh, then trade unions came along who fought employers, so who do you fight if you're in a cooperative, you know, so that was a worry. So the great thing about 193, it showed how trade unions and uh, worker cooperatives uh, and cooperatives of all types could work together very mm. carefully. And I watched um, Sterling Smith's uh, interview the other day, and of course that's his background. Mm -hmm. And indeed it's your, your he's not new anymore, but your current um, director, director general, general Guy, Guy Ryder, Ryder, Ryder from um, the Labour, is yeah. from that, that background as well. I'm, I didn't really know him, I think I only met him a couple of times, but he, uh, he um, sort of um, represents, uh, epitomizes the whole idea of 193, the coming together of governments, trade unions and cooperatives. And it's, it's, it's great to see him there. And I assume, I don't follow it day by day anymore, but I assume you still use it as a tool uh, very mm -hmm. strongly throughout the world. We have in fact done a stock taking a couple of years ago where we could trace more than 110 countries using the recommendation as a reference in uh, revising their cooperative policies, legislation, strategies. Dare I ask, does that, does that include the UK? <laughs> I'll have to check, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because we were, it, it was a struggle even with the Labour government, so I don't know what they're doing now, but I mean, that's what you have to push and embarrass them to say, what are you doing about this? You you mm. said you would you agreed to this recommendation. What are you doing about it? I don't know how mm. you, does it, this is. I'm interviewing you now, but does the, does the um, ILO do that? Does it actually say to governments uh, or ask them to fill in a 
question, follow-up questionnaire saying how much have you done to fulfill these recommendations? There are, in fact, uh, yeah, employment-related uh, standards and recommendation 193 is one of yeah. those. And they do have uh, reviews. Uh, and when the, that review comes up, there are questions regarding right. the state of uh, cooperatives and cooperative legislation in the country. Yes, indeed. Sure. Yeah. sure. Um, uh, I think th this has been very, very interesting. Uh, we are probably coming uh, to the end of our interview. We don't want to uh, keep you so much longer, but uh, you mentioned uh, Ivano Barberini. He was a grand thinker, leader, uh, uh, cooperative uh, um, a thinker and uh, he was also good friends with the uh, ILO DG at the time yes, uh, yes. and uh, Mr. Somavia and I was wondering if you had uh, you shared one uh, story of uh, Ivano Barberini if you wanted to share another one so we could remember him with you gosh you should have given me I'm a bunch sure of notice of that. No, I have, I have, I had tremendous um, stories about Ivano. I mean, uh, I, I do remember him. Uh, I think it was in Italy. Um, um, he and Juan Samavia. I remember they arrived, and for us at the time, Juan Samavia was seen as this very important um, and very striking and. Um, full of presence type of person and uh, Ivano was not like that because he was a small man but the two, <laughs> the two of them struck up an immediate friendship and I remember them me trying to find Ivano for an important meeting and um, I searched the whole of I think it was maybe Florence I can't remember where we were and I found him and Juan Somavia engaged in a most intense discussion in some cafe somewhere where Jürgen and myself both looking for our respective leaders and uh, found them both together uh, uh, most intense discussions and they, they enjoyed it and as a result um, the ICA benefited very often from Juan Samavia's um, um, involvement because they would come he would come and speak at our conferences much more so than his predecessors had ever done. So we benefited from that. But I do remember Ivano in coming out with the most uh, classic statement once, because his English wasn't perfect, but he could sum up things very well. And we were in the middle of, it was the time, unfortunately, of the tsunami in Indonesia. And we went to there and we were visiting cooperatives, which had been completely destroyed. And I see, yeah. And, and also at the time there were, there was some terrorist action and all ridiculous stuff. And um, he made a statement, I'm trying to remember what it was. It was very simple because it was about what cooperatives were as compared with uh, Arnold businesses. And he, he said, um, he says, investor owned businesses are about competition. Cooperatives are about peace. And he meant peace in the widest possible sense, mm -hmm. and they are because they're about bringing people together all the time. Whether it's whether it's an economic crisis, whether it's a social crisis, whether it's a health crisis, like it mm -hmm. is at the moment, cooperatives are about bringing people together and resolving conflict at the same time. And he was a great believer in that side of cooperation. I don't know if you ever read his book, How the Bumblebee Flies. You know he. This is a good story. He completed that on the last day of his life. Wow. His, I was due to go and speak to him go about one of our pre-agenda meetings. We knew he wasn't well. Um, I was due that day to get the train from Geneva down to uh, Modena. And he, um, his secretary rang me up in the morning and said, Ian, he shouldn't come. He's really not well today. And apparently she said that to him and he was furious because he liked our meetings and he wanted to tell me the latest um, important thinking he had reached. Um, and uh, later that day, I got another phone call saying he'd died. 
and that very day and that and she she told me that time um that he he actually wrote the last words of his book that morning mm. and died in the afternoon and it was so typical of the man and uh, but uh it was a sad loss because he was only looking back now he was only about 69 years old and mm. uh, i don't think if there's been some great presidents before and since of the ICA, but I don't think they ever had quite such a, a thinker uh, and a serious cooperator, you know, his whole life, to the expense of his family, of course, which is typical. Mm. Anyway, so yes, a great man. Thank you, Ian, uh, for those stories. Uh, so we could also honor his uh, legacy and uh, his role. Uh, yeah. Any final words for us at ILO Co-op, uh, 100 years, another 100 years, <laughs> new generation of cooperators? Uh... No, I mean, keep going. I mean, I'm delighted. Uh, it's a unique, the, the co-op unit in the ILO is, is unique, as you know, and um, there was a time when I was there when, you know, we were all suffering from austerity and financial issues that there was some doubt as it would be kept or that it would be absorbed into another part of the ILO. And we did our little bit of lobbying who we could at the time to make sure it was kept going. And I'm absolutely delighted that it is going because it is such an important body. And I get the newsletter to make sure I'm relatively up to date. Um, there was a couple of things. Um, I know you're interviewing, um, Sonia Njokovic from uh, St. Mary's and I was on her board for years and it's, it's, it, it's doing a job which nowhere else is doing in my opinion which is the, the educational side of the cooperative movement trying to teach managers cooperative management as opposed to just business management and there's not mm -hmm. one of my great things was always and we did some work on this to show that um, business schools had to teach cooperative management not just management because it was as i've said with the values and principles it's a different way of running a business is a cooperative mm -hmm. and you can't just assume that you learn how to run a cooperative by being in any old business and uh, st mary's are doing that oh you've disappeared are you still hearing me i'm still hearing you no, that's okay no there you are um so i do think that's another important very important sector is the is the is educational education. work. Hmm. And I know and across disciplines, no? You mentioned business, yes. law, economics, uh, pharmacy, you know. Uh, no. so I'd, love, I'd, I'd love to see uh, that coming to the fore no. more. And, and for instance, I don't think we ever quite achieved to get a list of all the educational establishments in the world who actually have cooperatives on their mm. agenda mm. on their on their curriculum in some way or other um, not many do here in scotland we have um, sterling university who mm. uh, where i got my doctorate and they're they're uh, doing a bit but not much um, and in england there are a few the co-op college is hoping to have university status soon but it's um it's, it's another yeah. area of work that needs to be promoted. Um, yeah, yeah. And so co-op education good. from early on, from high school, no? from elementary school, well, the value of cooperation. It's not even indeed. to wait till university, but continued education, vocational training. Well, um, yeah, yeah. I, I, until recently, I was on the board at uh, a trustee of New Lanark, where Robert Owen carried out his mm -hmm. uh, famous cooperative ideas and um, education was key to that. Education from, from five-year-olds onwards about mm. working together and, you know, um, mm. the importance of, of, uh, of um, togetherness rather than conflict and all this stuff. Mm. Uh, so important. And now we are moving on to online education, making yeah. the co-op learning uh, available uh, through interactive, uh, but also online. Yeah, and that's where St. Mary's comes in. They're, they're, uh, 
I don't know if they're exactly pioneers, but they're certainly one of the leaders in that field. Mm. And uh, it's great to see it happening. I agree. But online is everything these days. <laughs> yeah, especially during the time of the pandemic, no? no indeed. Uh, with all the lockdowns. Thank yeah. you so much for uh, your time uh, and your thoughts. To to you. And it was yeah, lovely talking with you. And yeah. we will be uploading this along with the text of your interview and some photos and disseminating it for all the world to hear and see. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> good luck to them. <laughs> and good luck to you and uh, I hope we can keep in touch. Yes, indeed. That would be lovely. Thanks okay. a lot, Ian. Take Thanks care. a lot. Bye. Bye.